European submarine history, the Firstborn Fleet. While submarine design has come a long way since the initial terrestrial colonization efforts and exploration ships, the Coalition, at my insistence, wanted to compile this historical archive to take a few minutes and remind the people of Europa, stationers and mariners alike, just how far we've come since those infantile submarine designs. The first born fleet, as it was known, was the original wave of submersibles utilized by European colonists arriving from Earth following the first successful manned landing in 2022. Easily identified by their blocky design and emphasis on fragile windows for visibility, many mariners are quick to comment that these ships aren't submarines at all, but some form of neutrally buoyant brick. This is partially correct, as the Firstborn fleet were actually a series of refits to the colony ships themselves, delivering people and supplies to the European surface when such a thing was possible. As a result, these early subs were both fragile and extravagantly spacious to the point of being unwieldy. But they were the best ships available at the time, and they served their purpose to carry colonists or construction teams to station sites, where more long-term subs were designed and fielded rather quickly. Sadly, few visual records survived of these submarines, but I'll display the visuals as I have them, and I'm going to run down the roster in order of decreasing approximate size. Firstly is a ship known as the Aegir which records indicate was a transport class designed for moving large numbers of civilians to newly built stations. It would have three distinct iterations as Europa proved itself deadly, warranting heavier hull plating and increased firepower to protect the large number of civilians on board. Azures were also rarely decommissioned and would instead simply be docked and welded to the stations, becoming part of the infrastructure which could then be expanded around as the station grew. The Nehalenia was the closest thing early colonists had to an assault submarine, equipped with two forward railguns and repurposed from an area of a colony ship's security section, meant these vessels were permitted to safely transport arms and ammunition. Next up, we have the Volama, a scout-class ship equipped with twin forward railguns intended for scouting new glacial passages. Overarmed and undermanned, these ships were usually sent a few hours in advance of an Aegir to ensure the passage to a new colony site was secure. The Blind Carp was a small unarmed transport show used to move supplies and VIPs between established colonies on secured routes. It was named for its lack of windows when compared with its contemporaries. Finally, the smallest of these early vessels was the Nibbler a colony ship escape pod retrofitted to serve as a basic unarmed transport shuttle, famous for its large forward-facing window. Surprisingly, a few nibblers can even be found today, as uh, I've actually unearthed a few reports from the great sea of apparitions known as uh, carriers. Uh, they appear to be minor thalamus growths that have taken a hold of nibbler wrecks, the problem being that thalamus growths are entirely plant-based soft tissue, but carriers seem to have uh, chitin growths, and some are even reported to have an aversion to calyxnicide, which I guess means this might be a technobiological strain of husk infection. Uh, sorry for that everybody, I uh, actually just got word from my supervisor here. Um, <clears throat> Carriers are not a real phenomenon, but instead, the product of vestigial memory and drunken navigator rumor milling. Please disregard any reports or sightings you may hear about them. So, uh, yeah, do that. Uh, anyway. Unfortunately, very few engineering manuals from the time survived at all, let alone any that provide technical specifications on these submarines, but, uh, I have here, provided by some friends of friends, an original colonist pamphlet they managed to find on a corpse that had sunk down below the Jovian radiation zone and could be recovered. The following here is an excerpt from Ice Life is the Nice Life, Europa and You Handbook, on the subject of submersibles. In your time on Europa, you will assuredly spend more than a few weeks traveling by submersible, but fear not. These space-worthy vessels are of the same design as those that brought you to the planet in the first place and are well equipped to handle any inconveniences en route to your new home. Brave words indeed, if stupid as hell. Not even an Azir could take a direct headbutt from a hammerhead without major hull damage, and to be fair, there wasn't exactly a better option. The humpback wouldn't be produced for almost a decade and a half. 
ancient history aside, uh, in honor of this day of remembrance, I also wanted to take a look at some successful attempts by amateur dockyard teams to recreate these symbols of Europic colonization. A uh, big thanks to you nutjobs who actually listen to these historical archives. You guys were a huge help in tracking the people down. Reproduction models of the Azure Mark III, the Volamo, and the Nehelenia are all available from Regala shipyards. According to my buddies on the dock, they never stopped making them. They just became made to order. The blind carp and some modernizations are available from a number of shipyards. It's usually a matter of taste. And finally, for you blaze of glory maniacs, my buddy Ricky says there's a dude named Waffles on deck six. He's selling nipplers on the cheap. He's got like a dozen. Go for it. They work. All in all, the firstborn fleet wasn't pretty, nor was it particularly effective. But they were crewed by the men and women of the colonization efforts who had the wherewithal and the know-how to take what they had and make it work. Try using that as inspiration the next time you're stuck. Whether that winds up being between ice sheets, mollocks, or just that tough open response on your engineering exam. <laughs>